You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. We are in the midst of a series of life lessons from biblical people, and we're in the midst of the time of the prophets. Today we come to the prophet Jonah. <clears throat> Our scripture is Jonah chapters 3 and 4. So chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going one day's journey. Going one day's journey, and he cried, yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, took off his clothes, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he made proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and of his nobles, let neither men nor beast nor flock nor herd taste anything. Let them neither feed nor drink water. Let both men and beast be clothed with sackcloth and let them cry mightily to the Lord. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands, for who knows? Perhaps God may yet repent and turn from his fierce anger so that we perish not. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did and how they turned from their evil ways, God repented of the evil that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And Jonah prayed to the Lord, and Jonah said, I pray thee, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? Is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, because I knew that you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, repenting of evil. Now, therefore, O Lord, take away my life. Take my life from me. I beseech thee. Is this, am I having some feedback with this? Because I feel like the sound is reflecting here. Anyway, now, O Lord, take away my life. I beseech thee, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went outside of the city and sat to the east of the city. He made himself a booth and sat under the shade of it till he would see what would happen to the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant, and he made it to rise up over Jonah, and the plant became a shade over the head of Jonah, to save him from his discomfort. And Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But as the day dawned the next day, the Lord appointed a worm and it attacked the plant and it withered. And as the sun rose, the Lord appointed a sultry east breeze and... The sun beat upon Jonah's head so that Jonah was faint, 
And Jonah asked that he might die. And Jonah said, it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah said, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. The Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120 souls, more than 120 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message. <clears throat> uh, dear Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In February of the year 1891, a whaling vessel was sailing through the South Atlantic Ocean near the Falkland Islands. And the whalers sighted a very large sperm whale. This whale was more than 80 feet in length, and they would later find out that it weighed more than 150 metric tons an unusually large sperm whale. Well, the whalers went off of the ship, which was called the Star of the East, with two boats, and the harpooners were in those two boats, and they began to harpoon the whale. And this whale was huge, and it was strong, and, and its tail came up underneath one of the boats, and it just threw it up into the air, and and the harpooners just flew out of the boat. The boat came back down and shattered. And the sailors in the other boat began to pick up their fellow sailors and rescued all of them but one man, and that one man was James Bartley. James Bartley was lost at sea. Well, finally, they killed the whale, and they brought the whale alongside the Star of the East. And they began to cut, and they began to work. They began to to cut its blubber, and they worked, they labored till midnight, and then they went to sleep. They woke up the next morning, and they used the derrick on the star of the east to lift this giant whale up onto the deck of the ship. And as they placed the whale on the deck of the ship, they noticed that there was a twitching in the stomach of the whale. So they cut open the stomach of the whale, and to their amazement, there was James Bartley. And he was alive. He had spent the entire night in the belly of the whale. He was unconscious, and they revived him, and he lived. James Bartley became kind of a superhero. He became famous all over the world. From that day forth, his hands and his face were bleached white from the acid in the whale's belly, but, but he lived, and from 1891 to the year 1900, for those nine years, James Bartley was a celebrity. He was interviewed all over the world by scientists and by the media. He died in 1900. He was called the second Jonah, the second Jonah. And to this day, Jewish people and Christian people have kind of loved the story of James Bartley because it's provided empirical evidence Scientific proof that a human being can indeed live for a period of time in the belly of a great fish. And I think a lot of people view the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah with a certain amount of skepticism. And of course, the book of Jonah has always been controversial. Controversial because of its literary genre. I mean, some Bible scholars believe that God has chosen a parabolic literary genre in the book of Jonah, that the book of Jonah is a parable. And, and these Bible scholars believe that the whole story of the great fish and the story of the plant and the worm, these are parabolic elements and, and make this a parabolic story. 
Other Bible scholars believe that the book of Jonah is historical narrative. And there's no doubt that Jonah is a historical person. He is described in 2 Kings chapter 14. And we are told that Jonah was the son of Amittai, that he was a prophet of Israel in the 8th century before Christ that he served as a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II, and that he lived in the town of Goth Hefer, which is not far or was not far from Nazareth. Certainly, Jonah was a historical person. And, and many Bible scholars believe that the book of Jonah is kind of a combination of historical narrative and parable. But you see, the problem is, in all of this discussion and in all of this debate, a lot of people miss the message that God has. He, they miss the message of the book. They miss the life lessons from this prophet Jonah. We don't want that to be true of us today. And so this morning, as we look at Jonah, we have two life lessons. And the first life lesson concerns righteousness. The, the theme of the book of Jonah, in a sense, is the theme of righteousness. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. <clears throat> and God would ask you this morning, Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Now, there's no doubt that, in a sense, Jonah longed for righteousness. Particularly, Jonah hungered for what we would call social righteousness. And this was true of all the prophets of Israel and Judah. They all sought social righteousness. They wanted a society where people were treated fairly, a just society. They wanted a society where there was compassion for the poor and where the oppressed would be liberated. They wanted a society where the laws of God would be implemented and respected. They wanted a righteous society. And this is what Jonah sought, a righteous society for his own nation and for other nations as well. Now, throughout history, there have been many people who've longed for social righteousness. And certainly, Plato, the Greek philosopher, was one of these. And you will recall that Plato wrote regarding the mythical continent of Atlantis and the whole story of Atlantis has fascinated historians to this day. And Plato described this continent of Atlantis as somewhere beyond the pillars of Hercules somewhere beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. He said there was this continent called Atlantis, and it was in the vast Atlantic Ocean. And he described this continent as characterized by righteousness. And Plato used the Greek word dikaiosune, which is the same word as is used in the Bible for righteousness. Plato believed that this continent had been destroyed by volcanic eruption 10,000 years before him. And he described it as a continent where men and women had lived in equality under law and a continent where, where the government ruled in peace and righteousness. Of course, historians have looked for this continent under the ocean, destroyed by volcanic eruption. Oceanographers have looked. Archaeologists have looked. And they've really found nothing. Some historians believe that Plato was really referring to the ancient Minoan civilization, which was destroyed by volcanic eruption with the eruption of Santorini. But of course, Santorini exploded a thousand years before Plato, not 10,000 years. And the Minoan civilization was not beyond the pillars of Hercules. It was not in the vast Atlantic. The Minoan civilization was a Mediterranean civilization, more precisely an Aegean civilization. And the Minoan civilization had never been characterized by righteousness. Men and women were not equal under the law in the Minoan society. 
There was poverty, there was oppression, there was corruption, there was violence. It was not a righteous world. So most historians today believe that Atlantis was simply for Plato his dream. It was his dream. His dream, his longing, his desire that there might come a righteous society. It was an imaginary dream world, kind of like James or, or Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Xanadu or James Hilton's Shangri-La, kind of like the modern-day Tibetans who, who desire and wait for a Shambhala, a little bit like Martin Luther King's dream as he gave that famous message where he said, I have a dream before the Washington Monument, and, and he dreamed of a just society, a society where people would be judged by their character rather than the color of their skin. He longed for a righteous society. Of course, we live in a country where we seek a just society, and there's always been promises. 1932, Franklin Roosevelt promised a new deal. 1948, Harry Truman promised a fair deal. 1952, Dwight David Eisenhower spoke of, of, the, of the, the great crusade for a better tomorrow. 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy spoke of the new frontier and all of the blessings and all of the equality that would come with it. 1964, Lyndon Johnson spoke of the great society and the promise of a new world. Of course, in 1988, George Bush spoke of a new world order. And we always live in this hope that our society might become just, that righteousness might reign, but of course, it never happens. Not in this age of the world. And as Christians, we look forward to the consummation and the coming of what the Bible calls the new heavens and the new earth, wherein righteousness reigns. But today, it's a world of unrighteousness. I mean, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where drug lords live in palatial splendor. There's no justice there. Corn peddlers get rich. Criminals are oftentimes not apprehended. We live in a nation where 40 million babies have been aborted since the passing of Roe v. Wade. And, and you understand, the overwhelming majority of these abortions have had nothing to do with danger to the life of the mother or gross fetal deformity or rape or incest. The overwhelming majority of these abortions have simply been belated efforts at birth control in an increasingly promiscuous society, and it's just not just. It's just not just. We don't live in a righteous society. I mean, we live in a world where poverty is pandemic. We live in a world where bad things happen to good people. This is not a just society. But you see, if you're a Christian, I don't mean a nominal Christian. There's lots of those. I mean, if you're a genuine Christian and you've actually given your soul to Christ and you've pledged your life to follow him, then, then you seek a more righteous world. You seek a more just society. And, of course, we look at Jonah, and we see that he did seek this. And he hated unrighteousness. Of course, Jonah was a prophet of Israel, but God was concerned with other nations as well. And, and God looked at, looked at Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, a Gentile empire, to be sure. But God saw the wickedness, the evil of the Assyrians and of Nineveh. I mean, it was a violent culture. It was a culture of oppression, slavery, bondage. It was a culture of incredible socioeconomic polarity with a massive sea of poverty and with rich people who didn't care. It was a violent nation. 
filled with criminals, and, and it was a pagan nation. And the chief god of Assyria was called Ishtar, the chief female deity, and she was a fertility goddess portrayed with rows of breasts across her chest. And the people of Assyria lived hedonistic lifestyles. Their lifestyles were immersed in materialism and violence. And Jonah knew these things. When God spoke to him and said, go and warn the city of Nineveh, I'm about to bring judgment from heaven upon them. And Jonah, Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah didn't want to go because he really believed that the people of Nineveh deserved judgment, and he was afraid that they might repent and find God's mercy. He really wanted them to be judged for their misdeeds. He wanted justice to be served. He wanted the poor to be elevated, the oppressed to be liberated, and the oppressors to be slaughtered. He wanted justice. That was Jonah. He wanted justice. And there's a sense in which we too should want justice. And of course, we live in a different nation. We live in a different time. But as followers of Christ, we should seek always justice, righteousness. And that means we should seek a society where there's compassion for the poor. That means we should seek a society where just laws are enforced. That means we should seek a society where the improperly oppressed are liberated. That means we should seek a society that treats everyone with fairness, justice. That means we should seek a society where the basic laws of God are venerated and respected. And we should seek a society where the institutions established by God are respected. And understand, from a biblical point of view, both the church and the state are institutions established by God for the welfare of humanity, both the church and the state. And I think Christians through the years have struggled with church-state relations and non-Christians as well have struggled with church-state relations. And there's a polarity of feeling on one extreme. You have people who want to absolute wall of separation between church and state, something Thomas Jefferson himself never sought, because Jefferson knew if there was an absolute wall of separation between church and state, then inevitably there would be a, a devaluation of the spiritual side of man. And on the other polarity, on the other extreme, you see people who, who want a church-controlled state, and this would be equally tragic. As his history itself proves, church-controlled states tend to excessively legislate morality and deny basic human freedoms and civil liberties. But we seek a just society, and it's not easy. We seek a society where all the institutions of God are valued from church to state, and, and as well as the institution of marriage, because, of course, marriage is a, an institution of God, established by God. And this is pertinent today, a live issue, because the gay lobby in America is seeking to redefine the institution of marriage. And we live in a nation where most people want to see gay gay people treated fairly, and as Christians, we should want to see all people treated fairly. But we must also seek a society where the institutions established by God are honored. And understand this, marriage is instituted of God, regulated by His commandments. The Bible describes marriage as a diatheke, it's a divine covenant established by God, the terms and conditions of which cannot be changed by man. We do not have the right to change marriage. God has established marriage as between a man and a woman, as a foundational unit in society, 
And the marriage union is until death do them part. We've already profaned marriage in this culture and nation through rampant divorce, through the infusion of pornography and adultery into relationships. We've already profaned this institution of marriage, and if we seek to redefine it, I promise you we will invite the wrath of God. We have a petition out in the lobby today. And there are two or three tables out there where you can go and sign this petition that seeks support for a, a federal marriage amendment. I want to encourage you to, to seek And like the prophets of old, that we hunger and thirst for social righteousness, which means that we treat, we want to, to seek to create a fair society, but also a society which honors the basic laws of God and the institutions of God. Well, there's a second theme in the book of Jonah more briefly, and the second theme concerns mercy. The book of Jonah is not just about righteousness, but the book of Jonah is also about mercy. And <clears throat> Jonah hated mercy. I mean, he loved righteousness, but he didn't love mercy. Now, perhaps there were certain forms of mercy Jonah loved because mercy is diverse. And indeed, in the book of Jonah, the Hebrew word for mercy is the word hus, which is transliterated into English as H-U-S. And in the Septuagint, the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Old Testament, this word hus is rendered by elios, the Greek word for mercy, the New Testament word. And, and both of these words can refer to a variety of mercies. I mean, both of these words can be used to refer to compassion, the desire to help someone who's, who's simply hurting. And I'm sure Jonah had mercy in this sense. I mean, I'm sure he had compassion for the hurting. I mean, just this past week on Tuesday, uh, Barb was driving home on Daniels Park Road, and she was there on the, on the dirt road approaching Daniels Park, and she saw a little puppy, a little, a little dog, and, and this dog had no collar and was skin and bone and looked like it was starving and desperate and, and was, was kind of violent because it was so distraught and, and just running loose, nobody around. So Barb pulled her cart over and she chased the dog and some other people helped her and they found the dog and they caught the dog and, and Barb took this dog to the dumb friends and, and, and she, you know, wanted to know what she should do, and, and they said, well, if you leave the dog here, we can't guarantee that it won't be put to sleep. And, and you know, they encouraged her to keep the dog, and they would register the dog as lost. And so Barb has brought the dog home, and I can tell she's now wanting to adopt this dog. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about that, but, but she's, she's wanting to adopt this dog, and it's mercy. I mean, it's all mercy. It, it's compassion for, a, for a, an animal that was hurting, just compassion. And I think you all have that kind of mercy, and I think Jonah had that kind of mercy, and Hus and Elias can refer to these things. They can also refer to a kind of mercy that's, that's like tolerance and forbearance. And again, we all need this kind of mercy. We, we need tolerance. We need forbearance. This kind of mercy means that you forbear or you tolerate people and things you disagree with. I mean, you can't live in this world. You can't live in society unless, certainly not a pluralistic society, unless you have some measure of tolerance and forbearance for things you disagree with. And this too is hus or 
Elias. This is a kind of mercy. And there's no reason to believe Jonah didn't have this kind of mercy. But you see, there's a third type of mercy, and it's, it's the most profound, the deepest type of mercy, and it relates to forgiveness. And this is where Jonah struggled. He just didn't have the mercy of forgiveness. And it was particularly hard for Jonah to want to allow forgiveness for, for people who had really been evil. I mean, when people were really evil, there should be no circumstance under which they would be forgiven. That's how Jonah felt. <clears throat> and that's why Jonah, that's why Jonah didn't, didn't want to go to Nineveh. That's why he got on the ship and headed for Tarshish. That's why you had the whole whale deal. It was all about forgiveness. I mean, he knew the nature of God. He knew that if he went to Nineveh and he went as a prophet and he walked the streets and he warned the people, there was a chance, there was a chance they might repent. And if they did repent, he knew that God was a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, repenting of evil. And he didn't want these people in Nineveh to be forgiven. He wanted righteousness, but he didn't want mercy. Now, God's a merciful God. There's no doubt about that, although his mercy is gravely misunderstood by our culture and by our time. But we see the mercy of God again and again in Scripture. And as we've gone through the life lessons, we've seen mercy. God's mercy, divine mercy. Remember when we looked at Manasseh, the king of Judah in the 7th century, perhaps the most wicked king in the history of the world, certainly the most wicked king in the history of Israel and Judah. Remember how Manasseh ascended the throne at the age of 12, and we saw how he rebelled against the ways of his relatively righteous father, Hezekiah. We saw how Manasseh rebelled against God. We saw how Manasseh became a kind of connoisseur of cultic pagan religions and how he became a student of the occult and practiced occultism. We saw how Manasseh built the high places and erected altars to the Baals. We saw how Manasseh invited necromancers and sorcerers into his city, into Jerusalem. And the incense just rose from the rooftops of Jerusalem homes in the worship of pagan deities. And we saw how Manasseh, worst of all, invited the cult of Moloch into Judah. And Moloch was a religious cult that practiced child sacrifice and child sacrifice began to be practiced in Israel and, and he would light the fires in the Hinnom Valley and force children to run through the flames and as they died in the flames and, and, and the Hinnom Valley became a place of human sacrifice so that Gehenna or Gehenna became a symbol of hell itself. And was not this man from hell? I mean, didn't he behave like someone who was inspired by hell? And yet an amazing thing happened, and you know the story how Manasseh was captured by the Assyrians, and the Bible tells us he was taken to Babylon. He was put in a dungeon, and there in a dungeon, as he was awaiting death, he repented. He repented. He cried out to the God of his fathers. And his repentance, the Bible tells us, was genuine. Not bogus, not phony, but genuine. And what did God do? Incomprehensibly, God forgave him. God responded with mercy. And he forgave Manasseh, brought him back to Judah, set him on the throne. And Manasseh changed because he repented. Metanoia is the Greek word for repentance, and it means to change the mind, literally, but it means to turn and walk a new way. He lived differently. He had truly repented, and the rest of his reign was righteous. 
He'd come into the world of God's mercy through repentance. Of course, we look at the prodigal son, and Jesus told that story, and you all know it. And you know how the elder brother, the oldest son, rebelled against his father and his family, demanded his inheritance, went to a foreign land, lived a debauched life, squandered his money, became broke, wound up feeding pigs and swine. And ultimately, he came to his right mind and he repented. He repented and he resolved that he would change. He came back to his home, said to his father, make me as one of your hired servants. I repent. And his father forgave him. And Jesus reminds us, God is like that. God is like that. Always willing to respond to repentance with mercy. But here's the problem. Here's the problem in our culture, even in our churches. Here's the problem. We want mercy without repentance. I mean, isn't that the problem? Don't we want mercy without repentance in this culture? I mean, Nineveh did not receive mercy until they had repented in sackcloth and ashes. From the greatest of them to the least of them. They repented, and thereby they found mercy. But we live in a time where people want to live how they want to live, and they just hope that God will have mercy. And God may indeed forbear sin for a season, but not forever. And the only way to come into God's eternal mercy is through repentance. And a Christian is someone whose life is, in a sense, summed up by repentance, a resolve to change. If, they're, if we're genuine Christians, if we really believe. Now, understand, we live in a world where there's a lot of nominal Christianity, nominal Christianity everywhere. But genuine Christianity is relatively rare. People who really believe people who've really made a commitment to follow Christ. You know, a week ago Sunday, I preached a sermon, and portions of it offended a number of people, where I talked about heaven and hell and the divine judgment in the context of the ancient of days in the book of Daniel, and I, and I related it to money and giving. And understand that in the Bible, the soul and money are often joined. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and mammon, which means money. And of course, mammon is the great God of our culture. I think the great God of our nation. Well, I received many emails, many letters, <laughs> phone calls, responses, and some of you were were encouraging and supportive, and I'm extremely grateful for your encouragement. Some of you are very upset. I'm, I'm grateful that you communicated to me and wrote to me. Some of you are very angry with me. But don't be angry with me because it's God you need to deal with. I mean, I'm nobody. You will not stand or fall before me. You will stand and fall only before God. And understand, as a pastor... As a pastor, my responsibility is simply to be a good steward of God's word and, and faithfully convey the promises of God and the warnings of God as they're contained in Holy Scripture to the people of God or at least to the people who claim to be of God. And I believe most of you are Christians who have given your life to Christ. But you see, a lot of us need to repent. I mean, we just need to repent. If you're not giving anything to Christ and the cause of Christ, the answer isn't to get mad. Certainly not at me. Repent. That's what the call of the Bible is. Repent. If you're living in sin in any way, repent. If you're having sex and you're not married, repent. If you're 
guilty day after day of slander and gossip, and you just enjoy gossip, repent. And if you're not giving money, if you're not seeking first the kingdom of heaven, repent. That's the way we enter the world of Christ's mercy. And that's the true gospel. I sometimes wonder, what Bible are people reading? What Bible are they reading? Yesterday, yesterday Barb and I uh, went to see the Passion of the Christ. Uh, we went with our family. It was really powerful, hard, I thought, hard to watch in places, certainly. And the violence, the violence was, was just over the top. But understand, historically, that Roman persecution, Roman crucifixion, Roman whipping and scourging, these Roman disciplines were over the top. And the reality is the movie accurately portrayed what our Lord Jesus Christ went through. And understand, he went through it for you. And he went through it for me. And as I was sitting there, I mean, I couldn't help but think of the words of the old hymn, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the folly of sin I resign. My precious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, it's now. And we need to live every day like that. Every day like that. Resigning sin. Repenting of it. Just recognizing how precious his redemption is. And loving him. And for the Christian, there's really no other way. We cheapen the cross of Christ when we preach mercy without repentance. That's cheap grace. And, and it's, it's, it's like cheapening the blood of Jesus himself. So we preach repentance. Jesus came preaching the gospel, Mark chapter 1, saying, repent. And if you've never done that, and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, truly, today's the day to repent and embrace him as Savior and Lord. And if you're calling yourself a Christian, but your life isn't lining up, today is the day to repent. Today is the day. So let's look to the Lord with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Perhaps there are some here who have never genuinely repented in the sense of metanoia, in the sense of wanting to see their whole life changed. And Lord, if they've felt the tug of your Holy Spirit, I pray they would say this prayer with me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, today. Come into my heart right now, come. I repent. I want to change. Come, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for all the suffering you went through. Forgive me. Wash me whiter than snow. And Lord, as I repent, I invite you to sit on the throne of my life, that from this day forth I will seek to follow you. No nominal Christianity, genuine Christianity. I will seek to follow you. Thank you for your eternal mercy. Lord Jesus, for all of us here, we pray for no cheap grace that if there's any area of our life where we're grieving you, we wouldn't just sit back and hope for cheap mercy, but we would repent. 
And we do the radical things because your gospel is radical. And we resolve to change for your kingdom's sake, for your mercy's sake. This day, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.